Now everybody talks about, oh wow, you raised $52 million, you did all that. But yes, I also had to do thousands of phone calls. I had to talk to a lot of customers. I had to hire all the employees, but I recruited and talked to these people. I worked with these people. This is not just for me. I live a life of service. And this is not just for my company. If my nephew, my sister heard this, my parents heard this, they're proud of me. Today's guest is Ruben Harris. Ruben is the CEO and founder of Career Karma. Nearly exactly two years ago, I started this podcast. It was in my bedroom in New Jersey. It was not fancy filming. It was not these nice cameras and lighting. It was the webcam on my MacBook. And the very first guest that we recorded with and published was Ruben Harris. This episode is not filmed in my normal studio. It's actually filmed in Miami, which is a really cool full circle moment. And really what I wanted to get at with this episode is how do you build a truly generational revolutionary company? And we attacked it from all sides. From first of all, what is even the psychology, the mindset, the makeup of the founder who can build a business like that? How do you raise the money? How do you get talented employees and people to support that mission? How do you get customers? We cover all of it in this one. And you know what? I, I just really wanted to say this because there was this incredibly touching special moment at the end where Ruben reflects on what keeps him going. On this journey, when you're trying to build something special, something that doesn't exist, it didn't exist before, you face so much rejection, you face so many moments, and I felt this, where you think about should I just quit? And Ruben really reflects on the thing that made him keep going. And without further ado, let's get into this episode with Ruben Harris. And there was one quote, as I learned more and more about you, that came to mind, and I wanted to hit you with it straight away. You must go against the grain. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Nipsey Hussle, it instantly made me think of you. And here's where I want to begin. When you think about your story, your experiences, the moments that matter, and we just put that quote into perspective, where does, where does your mind go? What do you think of? It's such a good quote because when we talk about building big businesses, obviously you have to have ambition. Um, you have to be thinking about finances. You have to be thinking about the industry you want to be in. I think one of the, like I spent eight years in Silicon Valley. I'm here in Miami, which is arguably one of the world's largest tech centers. Um, I've traveled the world and I see how a lot of people think. But one of the things that I'll say that's different about, I'll just say this about Miami versus San Francisco is, here you're going to be having people that are ambitious that are thinking about building big businesses. And I would say in Silicon Valley, my time there, you, you see a lot of people that have an opinion about the world and a vision for the future that they want to see differently. And their business is not just focused on doing something that makes a lot of money, but drives change for that future that they want to see. Mm. And so if you want to build a big business. You don't have to be unreasonable. You don't have to be someone that thinks differently. But if you want to build something that changes the world, you actually do. You know where my mind goes? It's like, there's a certain level of ambition that comes with that. Yeah. It's like, the, where, what I think of is, you're not only trying to change your life. Yeah. It's like you're trying to impact the world. Mm -hmm. And it takes a certain person to even think about that. And I really want to get to your story and just giving the context, the context of some of the things that you've done. When you kind of reflect, what's the, you think about Ruben Harris, you think about some of the things that you've achieved. What is like the earliest moment, the story that it just sets the context for everything else? Like when we're telling the story of Ruben Harris, it has to be in there. What comes to mind? Immediately, I just think about not getting anything the first time, right? So. It goes back to the whole thing around being unreasonable where um, I think Be I'm going to mess up Jeff Bezos' quote, but he says something about being stubborn on the vision but flexible on the details, right? Mm -hmm. Where in these attempts to drive behavior change and these attempts to create a reality for the world, 
you're going to be faced with resistance. Um, resistance from people that tell you your idea isn't good um, or that this would never happen, like boot camps versus colleges or skills first versus four-year degrees. Um, you're going to be faced with people that um, like certain formats. You're going to be faced with many different types of things. And um, in these attempts to, to manifest this into the world, it's not going to work out the first time. So you have to be comfortable and be flexible with the details. And so if you look at the through line from me before to now and even going in the future it's going to be not getting things for the first time and being comfortable increasing your speed of iteration mm. for the vision that you want to see into the world yeah you know what even when i read that quote in the beginning i don't think he's the one that initially said it but where i remember it from is nipsey hustle yeah and i remember immediately after he said that quote he said um with some radicals like that's how he thought about yeah. himself. Like we some radicals. And the reason why is that when you have a new idea, you appear radical because it's, yeah. it goes against the conventional belief. And so I'm curious for you, what is a moment where like those rejection moments where I think now because you have a business established and you've done like over 50 million in funding and all of these things and you have a team, there's more credibility there. But it wasn't always like that what comes to mind is just a a moment of rejection or skepticism which just it just hit at the time hmm. i mean I, I think that um i think a lot about the early days and people talking about tam right uh and for the people that don't know what tam is is, is total addressable market right um and you also hear a lot of people say that if you there's riches and niches, right? Mm -hmm. And we we even talked about this with your podcast, like what kind of audience, what kind of audience do you want to reach? Um, and sometimes people don't understand that if you want to reach a broad audience, you want to think big, but start small. And so early on, um, a lot of the things that I was doing, whether it was focused on boot camps or even as I go out to enterprise and I think about just the learning and development space, that is only a small part of a much broader thing. And so when I think about rejection, a lot of people misunderstand that even though I have big ambitions and my starting place might be somewhere that is seen as very small, mm -hmm. how it fits into the much broader thing. And that, and I would say like, when I got rejected from Y Combinator, like that was like one of the earliest things. It's like, it's the same idea when I applied again and got in, I just communicated it differently and I explained how the small thing fits into the bigger thing. And even today, I have to do the same thing where this vision that's now the world being changed by AI and how that affects career karma, how it affects people, how it affects work. You still have to start small to figure out what your your new voice is in, in this world. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? You mentioned um you mentioned Y Combinator. Yeah. And I think it's such a great example because there's people out there that their ambition is to build companies that raise millions, like hundreds of millions, tens of millions, uh, and companies that really have an impact, like they shift thinking. Yeah. And there was this quote that resonated. You spoke about applying and being rejected from Y Combinator in 2018. And this is what you said. And I actually think it's, it's special and it will resonate with people. You said, I realized the reason why we didn't get in was not because we didn't have a good idea. It was because we didn't know how to communicate very well. Yeah. What you do has to capture the problem you're solving, for who, and in this repeatable in a massive market, do you have some representation of being able to turn that into a revenue model that turns into a billion dollar company? Yeah. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I think... Um... When you're thinking about communication, you're communicating to different people. Like right now, I'm speaking to an audience that might not be investors, right? It might be people that want to start their own businesses. So speaking to a founder, you might be focused more on the dreams, right? And the, the world that you want to see. When you're talking to an investor, you might have to understand just the finance or, or part of it is like vision is important, but 
what are the billion dollar companies that exist in this space? Which companies have generated not a hundred million in revenue, but a billion dollars in revenue in your space? Can you tell me? And you have to be able to know that, but also understand that if you're manifesting the future, there's another great quote. I'll, I'll talk about Jeff Bezos a lot. He says like, um, when the da data and the anecdotes don't agree, you know, pay attention to the anecdotes, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to figure out how to have a conversation about the data, about the current market, about the history and the future that you're going to, to figure out how to connect all those things. So you got investors that you got to talk to. You have users that use your platform. And for us, we have people that use our platform to get a new job, but then there's companies that we're working with and what does the HR teams and the managers thing and the C-level think inside an organization? What do the employees that use our product inside of a company, how do they use it? Because that's different than someone trying to get a job, right? Mm -hmm. All of them need to be communicated with differently. But then also, how do you market the product, right? If I'm at a conference, how do I speak about it on my website? All these things all, all matter. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what is the intended result? Like with an investor, the intended result is getting a check, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a customer, I'm talking about their problem, a hair on fire problem, and by paying me money, then they can solve it, right? For you guys, might be starting a business. I don't know, right? So whatever your intended result is, you have to communicate it in a way where if it's YC, you know, are you going to build a legendary company that changes the world? And how does YC specifically help us get there? And it's not just the money. You have a network of 9,000 CEOs that you can talk to at any given time that are in the trenches with you that you can get advice from, you can sell to, you can collaborate with, um, and, and it's easier to, to go farther together than, than alone. Yeah, I think it's this, it's this awareness of stakeholders, like yeah. the different stakeholders, and then crafting your message to hit back those groups of people it makes sense. You know what? So we say that that's in, that was Ruben in 2018. Yeah. We're in 2024 20, now. So what is that? Six years. Yeah. I'm just curious for you to even reflect on the person that you were in 2018 when you were stepping into those rooms and presenting to people at Y Combinator versus who you are now. Like, what's the difference? Like, if I if I was even just to take a bird's eye view of your life and say that I'm following you around every day in 2018, and now I'm following you around every day in 2024, what are the differences that I'm going to see? Well, I almost lost my voice when you said six years. Just thinking about six years running my own thing with my team and my co-founders is just crazy to think. It's the longest job that I've ever had. Um, it still feels like day one, right? We talked about your podcast, like, and being like this, I, even though it was first was two years, it feels like it was just yesterday. Mm. Um, I feel like the same person, but I recognize the importance of making decisions, right? The importance of making decisions faster. Um, you can't live so much in the hypothetical. You can't live so much in the debate and the conversation or the strategy. You have to live in the doing. And the doing is going to lead you to the answers. The answers and the advice that you're going to get from a lot of your advisors is going to be some variation of talking to your users or your customers. And you can talk about how pretty a color is in a logo or a brand or a design. You can talk about a product feature. You can talk about a new vertical that you want to go down. But at the end of the day, you won't know if that's truth or not unless you talk to the people. Mm -hmm. So I try to optimize to remind myself that the magic is talking to people and to stay talking to people as much as possible, not just from a customer perspective, but even my team perspective, what are their thoughts, right? Everything is not going to come from me, right? Even though there's a lot of founder magic, like if we think about AWS, that came from someone within the organization, not Jeff Bezos. If we think about Flaming Hot Cheetos, that came from a janitor in the company, right? They didn't come from the CEO, right? So how do I talk to people, these stakeholders, 
not just to get things right, but to collaborate and and work deeper as a team. And I'm also learning a lot about um, the challenges of teamwork in a larger organization, especially in a distributed environment or a hybrid environment or an in-person environment. So mm -hmm. yeah. when I first asked you that question, I saw something in your face and you spoke about the significance of running your own thing. Yeah. Doing that for six years of working with your co-founders. And I could just, I could just feel that it meant something. Just even being able to say that, that you've been running your own thing for six years. And I think, you know, when we, and, and I felt it because uh, just being early in, in this journey of building a business, there's like a pride of like, at least I'm doing my own thing. Bro, it's, it's, it's a deeply emotional, spiritual thing. Like, I don't know if people know this, but 2023 was the largest number of startup deaths since the dot coms, like press, mm. right? And 2024 is going to see a lot too, right? So if you are a founder and you're still alive today after 2023, that is powerful. The fact that you woke up and you exist and you're still running your thing is a blessing. It's a privilege. You know, you probably are prefer pressure as a privilege, right? I'm grateful mm. that I can do this every day. So that's why we acted like that. I'm curious, is there moments in that journey, in that six years where like it came close to not being the case? Yeah. There were, yeah. Tell me about like, which is the first, like when I even say that, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You know, you talked about the Ruben a 2018 versus the Ruben now or the career karma in 2018 versus the career karma now. You know, in 2018, I had to fight to get press. Now, the decisions that I make, make the news, even if I don't want it to make the news. What headlines am I thinking about right now? I had to make cuts last year. Mm -hmm. I had to say goodbye to people that I care about, that believed in us, that makes the news, but I had to do it to survive, right? Our company, you know, when we did our first episode, that was 2021, mm -hmm. right? We had just done our series B. Thank God we made the right decisions where we still have five years of runway, but we had to make hard decisions in order to stabilize mm -hmm. and figure out what the next chapter is, right? I think, and, it, and it's actually been the case, even me just growing up, there's this romanticization of what it means to be a founder. Everyone thinks about the Mark Zuckerberg story, the Bill Gates, the Jeff Bezos, these incredible companies that are built billion dollar valuations um people have really fallen in love almost like with what it means to be an entrepreneur and everything that comes with it and i think not enough is said of the psychology of the person that needs to be built so that you can deal with something of like i love this person like they're talented, they're an asset to this organization, but I'm going to have to let them go because that's just the reality. Like not that side of it isn't shown. And can you kind of just speak to like, what, what does it take to be even able to do something like this? Bro, it's, it's the emotion of it is so heavy, bro. Like, and it's, it's you got to think about it. Yeah. Everybody talks about, oh, wow, you raised $52 million. You did all that. But yes. I also had to do a lot, thousands of phone calls. I had to, you know, talk to a lot of customers. I had to hire all the employees. Not all of them, obviously I had a team, right? But I, but I personally recruited and talked to these people. I worked with these people. The best way to describe the feeling, it's gonna sound really dark, but I hate, I hate this type of a conversation but it's real. It's, um, it's like, it's like attending a funeral, but you're the, you're the cause of, of everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're like the killer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I know that that's an extreme like version and 
people say hire fast, fire fast. And that's true. You do have to be able to hire fast, fire fast, evaluate performance, understand all these things. But there's some people, regardless of how they performed, that you have to say goodbye to. And the way you say goodbye to somebody really matters on both sides, right? Because you're going to see each other again, right? So it's not a funeral. It's not a death. It's a see you later, mm. right? So the way you say goodbye to each other really sets up your next hello, mm -hmm. right? But it still hurts. And you still are misunderstood, right? But that is part of the job as a CEO. It's not just to raise the money and make the money. But rule number one is don't die. You know, one of the biggest costs of an organization is payroll, right? And you're seeing not just small companies, not just tech companies do layoffs. Last year, you saw some of the biggest companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, tens of thousands of cuts. But not just them, you see big Fortune 500 companies as well. But these companies are also still thriving. Those people are talented. We do everything that we can to help them find a home as well. And we, we, we have their back, but it doesn't change the fact that it hurts. Right? And over the last four years, when you raise a month, like, like maybe we've been around six years, but the first four years, it was raise money, raise money, raise money. During COVID, we didn't have to lay anybody off. We had to do some adjustments to stabilize, but we were able to like do some things to get profitable. And that was great. Um, and then we had the series B round, but then you just, we have to shift the mindset to be like, Hey, nobody's raising money right now. How do I stay alive? But after you transition from right sizing to staying alive, how do you unlock the next chapter of growth for the company? Because a company is never its first product. It's like Coca-Cola doesn't just sell Coke, mm. right? Tesla doesn't just sell the Model Y, right? Delta doesn't just sell consumer flights, mm. right? It's the name of the game, right? It's like you're not, you don't want to stay in one role forever. Even if you stay at one company, you want to get promoted or you want to have a new responsibility, right? And there might be certain adjustments you have to make. Maybe you're in one role, you might have to take a pay cut or get a pay raise and get a new challenge. So like these are all ebbs and flows that happen personally and professionally. But to your point, the founder side, the psychology side, this is why I encourage everybody to read biographies. If you read the biographies of people, people love talking about Steve Jobs. Read about Steve Jobs' story. Read, read about Apple's layoffs early on. Read about Pixar's layoffs early on. Pixar was hanging on a thread early, right? Well, look, read all the biographies and you'll see there's always a period of these types of adjustments. Mm. Apple's was called the bozo period. When I look into your, into your story, and the thing that comes across, there's a certain relentless nature to you, right? There's a certain side of things where you come up against obstacles. And at the mo I, I don't know this, but I'm assuming in the moment that you face them, maybe they even felt, they felt so large, almost insurmountable. Yeah. But there's a certain relentless nature to you where you just keep going through it. I remember even hearing something where you were speaking about sending 900 emails. Mm -hmm. People don't even typically think like that. Like, I'm not going to send one email. I'm not going to send 10. I'm not even going to send 100. 900 emails. And I even just think about what you just mentioned, which is a business and building a special business. A business is a living, breathing thing. And it's constantly adapting. It's constantly shifting. It's constantly changing. The things that it requires from you as the founder, as the CEO, therefore constantly has to shift. The, jobs, the job description is constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you spoke about in the beginning, we couldn't get any press and now we're always getting too much press. Um, the, the job requirements are constantly shifting. And when my mind went, I think about preparation. Yeah. I think about being prepared. And when the moment comes and something is required, am I prepared? And as your job is shifting, it must feel so difficult to feel prepared. Mm -hmm. But obviously you do because you're still here, right? Yeah. Your business hasn't hit death. So you have been prepared. I'm just curious when you reflect on the life of Ruben Harris, what do you think prepared you to do what you're doing now? Quick break. I have such huge ambitions for what this show is going to do in the next year. I want to take this show to an even higher level. What I'm talking about is better production, it's even better guests, and actually starting to put out episodes twice a week. Here's the thing though, in order to do that, we need to bring on the right sponsors and partners that support the show. But I don't want to do this like every other podcast where they just roll out sponsors to you that you don't care about. I want to choose the right sponsors for this show. And this is something that I need your help with. Go to the link in the description below, answer five multiple choice questions. You can complete it in under 90 seconds. And this is going to give us all the information and insights that we need so that we can get the right sponsors for this podcast. And here's what I can promise you. If you answer those questions, we're going to take this podcast to an even higher level, better guests, better production, more episodes delivered straight to you every week. Please help me help you. I am blessed to be surrounded by people that have faith and taught me what faith actually is. And when you hear the word faith, you're probably thinking I'm talking about God, which I am, but I'm also talking about belief in you and your potential, right? So if you have people around you that are constantly telling you, hey, bro, I know that such and such happened to you and it hurts, but don't forget who you are, right? Don't forget what you're called to do. When you have people like my friend Ty, bro, he does that all the time. Our girl, my mom, like, you know, people do that, that is necessary. That's why, like, when I talk about YC, when I talk about advisor networks, when I talk about all these things, like, psychology is not just going to come through you. Yes, you know, I do subscribe to a lot of the David Goggins philosophy, right? I do think at the end of the day, you know what you got to do. You can go to all the podcasts, you go to all the conferences, you have all the coaching, you have all the therapy, you can read all the books. A lot of them are going to give you different variations of the same thing. So you know what you got to do, you got to do it. But at the same time, having peers and mentors and advisors that encourage you and also recognize that they can't give you the answers and that you got to figure it out, but they can tell you, hey, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. And I believe in you, especially from people that have built billion dollar companies before. Mm. That feels good. What doesn't feel good is people that have said that they believe in you and they have built billion dollar companies. And then they tell you they don't believe or that maybe, maybe you got to give it up. That is the other flip side where similar to too much press, too much information, too much advice, you start second guessing that gut feeling, that purpose that you got inside you, but you were called to do something, you know, yeah. you got power through. You can see so many stories like, you know, Figma, right? Zero revenue for four years ends up becoming 20 plus billion dollar SaaS exit. And then what happens? It didn't go through. It didn't go through. Billion dollar breakup fee. Still some money, 
but it's very different from 20 plus billion dollars. And guess what? Back in the trenches. And so when you listen to numbers like that, you're like, man, man, he still got a billion dollars. He's still, ah, oh, first world problems. Yes. But imagine the psychology of that. Every, like the press was largest SAS exit effort, largest life. Blah, blah. Bro, that hurts, man. It hurts. So, yeah. You know what? Even as I as I hear that, I even think about like um, like Steve Jobs' story. Yeah. I think about some of the companies he's built, like being involved. Next. Obviously, obviously, Apple, but then like a Pixar. Yeah. Which is an incredible business. Yeah. And even with Apple being like fired and ousted from your own company and then coming back and the psychology of that and then taking it to another the psychology of what it takes to truly build a special company. Read the Steve Jobs, Becoming Steve Jobs, not the Walter Isaacson. Read Becoming Steve Jobs. Toy Story was one the, the key to before the IPO mm. from Pixar. But the execs at the other studio that I won't name, even because I'm a big fan of that company. No, I'll just say it. Disney. Kassenberg, at least according to the book, did not believe in Toy Story. Toy Story. Mm. That success of Toy Story is part of the reason why that IPO was so successful. But he bet the company on that IPO, uh, on that movie, right? But people were telling him that that's, that story wasn't going to work. Mm. That movie wasn't going to work. You know what's interesting? I think about, you mentioned instinct and gut. Mm -hmm. And it, it always has to come back to that. And it's, it's interesting you even bring up the example of Toy Story. Obviously, we just came off the the Christmas New Year period, um, one of the Disney movies that my younger sisters absolutely love is Ratatouille. Yeah. And you you think about the plot of that movie. I just think about a script writer or the person who came up with that idea walking into a room and being like, I have this vision for a movie. It's a rat in Paris who's cooking at a restaurant, at a Michelin star restaurant. Like you're even smiling, like it sounds completely ridiculous. That's a movie that people are watching five, ten years after it came out. Even Toy Story, the plot of that bill, you hear it, you're like, I don't really know if this is you. If we maybe we should keep go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. Like we need to do some more ideas. But that is that is a big part of what it is. It's like when you feel something, and you just have that, you're just adamant. Yeah. This is, this is it. This is my thing. Like, this is going to work. But the storytelling matters, right? It, it reminds me of one of the first people that helped me get into Silicon Valley, Balaji Srinivasan. Like, he talks about the idea maze, right? You probably heard about the idea, idea maze. I haven't. Tell me about it. Um, idea maze is essentially, like, if you have this, like, vision for changing the world, you have this big plan, you have to understand what the end goal is, but you also have to understand which routes lead to treasure which route leads to traps and which lap trap routes lead to certain death, right? Mm -hmm. And as a founder, you have to be able to identify which path that you're on and when you need to adjust or change course in order to get to that ultimate objective. The reason why I think about it is you talk about storytelling. When you think about storytelling, you think about movies, no movie is awesome if everything works out perfectly. There has to be roadblocks along the way. So what are the roadblocks that you're probably going to have to face? What are the things that you're going to overcome? There's things that you control. There's things that you can't control. But like recognize that you will face roadblocks and overcoming the roadblock and will make your story greater, right? When we talk about storytelling at Pixar, it was making me think about Airbnb, right? And Brian Chesky. Look at what happened to Airbnb during COVID. Their revenue went down to zero, zero. After being hot, 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 they stayed alive. They made some calls that were expensive looking at the time financially to stay alive through outside investor help and other, other business adjustments. And now they are killing it. But a lot of them, if you look at the headlines and you look at the press that they didn't ask for, they were saying that it wasn't going to work. You know, my mind goes, it's like, and, and this is actually a key aspect of storytelling, of telling great stories, which is 
The story really gets great when you hit that roadblock, the insurmountable obstacle. Mm -hmm. And so what my mind goes is when you hit that roadblock, the thing that just feels like this might be the end of it all, that's actually your greatest. Yeah. Moment. That's what's going to propel you to the new height. But, but even on a more positive note, like in the early days, Airbnb, according to what I've seen and what I've heard, um, there's like a project called Snow White. Mm. And they literally, when we talk about communication, would storyboard like a animation, the journey of a guest and the journey of a host to understand what that experience is, how, how to not only communicate it, but convey the feeling that they wanted people to have on both sides of the aisle. They will personally go out to these different places, but it started off with the storytelling of it, the whiteboarding of it, the, 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 the breaking down of it. So if you look up Snow White, you'll see how all of these things tie together. Mm. You know, I want to get, I want to get deeply practical for a second. Yeah. Because I think there's people that hear this and they just have it in them. They just have that ambition that they want to build a special business and they want to build a business that, that changes things, that it, it shifts things, not only in their life, but in other people's lives and the people that work there and their customers, all of these things, they want to build a huge business. And instantly when my mind goes is even what you were saying after that Y Combinator rejection, which is what you do has to capture the problem you're solving. For who? And is this repeatable in a massive market? And do you have some representation of being able to turn that into a revenue model that turns into a billion dollar company? And when I read that, here's where my mind goes. There's a certain psychology and a framework of actually even having a billion dollar idea. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, and I, like, even for me, don't understand what a billion dollar idea is, like a billion dollars. There's, talk to me about, you, you even spoke earlier about TAM. Talk to me about the nuts and bolts of really coming up with even a, an idea that can potentially hit a billion dollar valuation. What I like, I like, um, Michael Seibel, for the people that don't know who Michael Seibel is, he's the guy who, uh, with his co-founders, built a company called Twitch that got sold for a billion dollars to Amazon. And he talks a lot about hair on fire problems, right? And he's, and a lot of people like overthink their solution or they think that the genius is in the solution, um, but the genius is actually in the the problem, right? So the bigger the problem, the bigger the company, right? Small problems, small company, right? So a lot of the homework that you have to put into is like, what is a large problem that affects a lot of people that they have frequently where if you can solve this thing in a way that leverages the money that they are currently paying to address it with alternatives and do it in a scalable way that you can do something big. And I, I like his um, hair on fire problem analogy because you've probably heard the vitamin versus painkiller analogy, mm. right? Where some people might nitpick this comment, but you don't need vitamins like supplement, like you get it from food, but you might need a painkiller, right? Uh, and so when you think when you're trying to start something in a hard to solve area, like in a, pro a big problem area, I really like the hair on fire analogy because he said, if someone's hair on fire is, a, is on fire and you give them a brick, they will use that brick and smash their head to try to put that fire out. Yeah. They'll take anything. Right? Obviously, like water or something else would be better. But like when you identify a hair on power fire problem, they will take anything. Why does this analogy matter? If you're talking, if you if you've done the homework to identify a big problem that affects a lot of people, that is repeatable, that software can solve, and and you offer them anything and they aren't reacting to it, 
you might not have identified the problem. Well, it's not your solution. Like you might be, or you might just be just thinking about it very differently. But I think just in general, like you're not solving a need, right? You're solving something that's nice to have. That's not a priority for them. It's not a hair on fire problem. You might, you might be addressing, I don't know, some other need that they have that they got to focus on. Right. But it's not the priority, which is my hair is on fire right now. Mm. Right. You're not thinking about all the other secondary problems that come from your hair being on fire. You know, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, I think I think it's really important. It, it, it's, a, it's sorry, it's it's just a different way of thinking. Where a lot of times you'll look at these companies that are built, and you're like, "Man, I could have thought of that." Mm-hmm. And people are like, "Oh, well, you did it," but it actually your idea doesn't matter so much. Like your solution doesn't matter so much because it's gonna change. Right, there's a company that's in our batch from 2019, the Y Combinator, that started off with a completely different idea than they have now, and this year they're going to hit 500 million in revenue. Mm. Right, I'm not there, and I'm still working on the same idea, but I'm also looking at the world and adjusting. But what I'm saying is like, your idea will change, but what am I still stubborn on? The vision, flexible on the details. But as we think about the vision, what problem? What is the problem that you're solving? If you can't answer that, and it's hard. Mm-hmm. You might not get it in a week, a month, a year even. It takes a lot of deep thinking to address, to think about. We talked about a lot of things related to the problem, but something else that I'm learning is the difference between a company that makes five million in revenue a year, a hundred million in revenue a year, and while you can create a category and create a company that generates billions of dollars that never existed before, it is important to understand history, right? Even though you have books like Zero to One that talk about competition is for losers, um, so don't compete with anybody. You still have to understand the players in a problem space. So when you do your research on the companies in the problem space, ask yourself how many of them have generated a billion dollars in revenue, hundred million dollars in revenue, ideally orient on bigger. So just ask yourself a billion dollars in revenue. Ideally there's multiple companies that are generating at least a billion dollars in revenue. If you want to build something that changes the world, because the problem is so big. It's like Salesforce. Salesforce generates tens of billions of dollars a year. They're a CRM. But there's lots of CRMs that also generate billions of dollars of revenue. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a problem space. Right? So I say that because you can do your research on a problem space, identify companies that generate a billion in revenue. And if there's like only one or two, that's okay you can still generate a company that generates a billion dollar revenue. But the fact that no tech company or non-tech company has created a company that's generated a billion revenue in your problem space is an interesting fact that you should consider as you're deciding what problem you want to solve that changes the world. You mean so? No, that's good. You know what my mind does when I hear that? It's also like testing your idea yeah and the thing that i think about and i'm actually really curious to to get your take on is taking something from personal to scale and and here's what i mean there you spoke about like the hair on fire problem and so some things are nice to have and there's some things you're solving a hair on fire problem and when you're solving a hair on fire problem the amount that you will be compensated for that and the value creation is what takes you to a billion, multiple billions, right? Yep. But then I think about something that I actually read recently, and you mentioned Airbnb, which is if you look at the origins of Airbnb and you listen to Brian Chesky even talk about it, Airbnb was not started with the intention of being a billion dollar 
I don't even know what that market cap is at the moment. Multiple, multiple, multiple billion of dollar company. It was all started with that intention. It was started with me and my friend need somewhere to live in this city. And like, can we just live in someone's room and maybe that would work? And then, oh, if we did this, maybe it would work for someone else. And so you speak about research, you speak about all of these things and solving a hair and fryer problem. Airbnb started with just solving a hair and fryer problem for them. Yeah. For them personally. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of curious about that, that testing phase of like, okay, maybe I'm actually just scratching like a personal itch. I'm solving a personal problem. But when does a personal bo problem become a, something that I can solve at scale? I mean, uh, you bring up a very good point where when you're thinking about this hair on fire problem to solve, what hair on problem, fire problems do you have yourself? Mm. Right? Like what, 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 the reason why the problems that you have yourself really matter is because of something called founder market fit. So whether you're raising money or bootstrapping, um, founder market fit still matters, right? Because there's a difference between missionaries and mercenaries, right? Missionaries, I believe, are better, right? Because you are personally driven to do this because you feel like you are called to do this, right? If you have a problem, a hair on fire problem personally for yourself or someone in your family, for your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, you're going to be pretty driven to solve that hair on fire problem, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also going to be something you think, you make you think about this not as work. Right. Steer. Startups are hard. There's less than a 1% chance to do this. That's why I keep talking about the privilege piece. Uh, but there's going to be very like tough slogs that could be boring or hard or rough, but like that personal drive, that personal thing that you're talking about will help you power through. Mm. You know, I want to read, I want to read some numbers, uh, from career karma. So March 2019, 437,000 pre-seed round. July 2019, $1.5 million seed round. December 2020, $10 million Series A round. January 2022, $40 million Series B round. But I want to start in the beginning, the pre-seed round. Because I think one of the things that you actually articulate really well you cannot predict in the beginning what all of this is going to be. If you do have the privilege of building a huge business that changes lives, that changes how people even think about entrepreneurship, you're not going to have the privilege of seeing every step or knowing every step. But maybe we can give you an insight into those first few steps. And so let's give the example of someone that they have their idea and they feel, it feels to them that it's a hair on fire problem. There's an urgency to it. And they think that there's other people like that. The TAM, as we call it, total addressable market is out there for the product. When it comes to raising dollars against that idea, what are like the first few steps? Like give me an insight into that. Yeah, no, I didn't even know what TAM was. <laughs> I think it's like what, what you're talking about where it's like, Career karma, career karma wasn't something that we sat down and thought about to build as a business. It started off as a podcast like this. It started off as us recognizing that my co-founders, Archer and Timor, went through boot camps. My brother went through a boot camp. They got into a job, and it was hard through a skills first respect. But they got a job making six figures, becoming software engineers without going to college and without debt in less than a year. And what if the rest of the world knew about this? And are there other people like us? Because there was multiple times along the way that we almost quit. And if we heard inspirational stories like the ones that you have on your show of people 
that have been through what we've been through that will help us stay motivated along the way. And by sharing those stories, not only did we attract other people for this show and people that wanted to make a similar transition, we attracted the training programs and the companies that wanted to provide skills to people, but also the people that wanted to hire them, which started getting us to think about the future of work, automation, AI, which is not a 2024 thing. People have been talking about automation and AI for years. Our stat in Y Combinator was 375 million workers are going to switch careers between now and 2030. Instead of going back to college, they're going to find their next jobs. And everybody was like, oh, robots are not going to come. Oh, people still got to go to college only to get a job for certain jobs. It was like, they're not talking like that no more. Mm. Robots are here. Skills first training is here. Not just that tech companies, Fortune 500 companies. Half the companies have dropped the, the requirement to have a bachelor's degree to go to college. And, and everybody's talking about student loan debt forgiveness, like $1.8 trillion now. Got to do something. At some point, like it goes in sideways, you know. But I, I say all that just because um, of what you said. I know this may not sound like a direct answer to the question, which was, how do you go about raising the money? Mm -hmm. But the people that I know that have built something that is worth billions of dollars powered through it in a very deeply personal way. And the people that bet on them and believe in them said, hey, we're betting on you and we're aware that it may not work out and the money might go down to zero. Mm -hmm. and, but we will do whatever we can to help you create this reality, right? Stubborn on the vision, right? Flexible on the details, right? Uh, but some people like the founders of GOAT is a really good example. The founders of GOAT, the sneaker app, Started off as a completely different idea. They got to the point where they're like, hey, it's not working. I'm going to give the money back. And they're like, bro, we gave you the money to use. And they created Go. Mm -hmm. Right? Why do I say that? Again, in the beginning, you don't have to have every step mapped out. Right? Even though you have this big vision, the how is the hard part. And you just break it down in phases, like think big, start small. Okay, so I want to help everybody, like in their career. I want to help everybody, but start with tech. Start with software engineering. Start with something, mm -hmm. right? Um, but people make decisions emotionally. We talked about decisions before. So if I'm communicating to investors, I have to not just appeal to their finances. I have to uh, appear. Uh, I have to make. I have to appeal to their ideology. I have to appeal to their emotion, because they're going to bet not just on the the idea, which I would say is smaller in the C state. You bet on the team. They're going to. They're going to ask, "Is this the best team in the world to solve this problem? What evidence do they have?" Trying to solve this problem. Why do they want to solve this problem? Why is the best time? This is the best time. What is my personal philosophy as an investor in this space? Mm -hmm. Have I bet on companies like this before? If I have, did it work? Did it not work? And if it didn't work, let's say all their bets didn't work, do they still believe in this space? Because some people might be jaded. There's like a recency bias. Some people lean into it and be like, hey, Edison took 99 times before the light bulb, the light bulb. If we didn't keep going, we wouldn't have no light bulbs. All right? But if you want people to bet on you and somebody's, like, for, for example, perplexity, right? Perplexity? Bro, search is changing. Like, for the people that don't know, perplexity AI just raised at a $500 plus million dollar valuation. Guess how much revenue they're making? See, zero? Zero dollars. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you think? The vision, I'm assuming. The vision, the usage, right? Mm. The behavior change that is driving, right? The team, 
the time in the market, right? Mm. Everybody's talking about ChatGPT, Bard, Anthropic, you know, all of this, right? But search, search is going to change. We know search is going to change. It's going to change. Perplexity seems like a good bet. It makes, like, anybody that sees it, be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. This could be the next Google? Maybe. You know, I um, I remember going to a conference, and there's this guy there, very eccentric, um, and he helps businesses raise money, like fundraise. And one of the companies that he's worked with recently is Liquid Debt, the, mm. the water yeah. brand. Right. Yeah. Brilliant idea, but so simple. I guess just, just this context. It's uh, water, but it's in like a can. And so I guess the insight was like, so many people are going to concerts, bars now, and they don't want to drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. But then they don't want to be kind of ostracized from the group that they're not drinking a beer or whatever. So let's just put water in a can. And when you're in the bar, when you're in the concert, it looks almost as if you're uh, having a drink, but it's just water. And anyway, so he helps uh, Liquid Death raise millions of dollars. And people always ask him, and he says this in the conference. So like people always ask me how to fundraise. And he said that successful fundraising relies on two things. Number one is storytelling. Number two is momentum. Okay. Obviously, there has to be some substance there. That's a given. But storytelling, if you can convey your story and communicate in a way where it relates and it resonates with people, and then momentum. If you can say on day zero, on when we started, obviously we didn't have any customers. Now we're on day one hundred, and there's thousands. And then from day a hundred to day a hundred and twenty, that one thousand has gone to ten thousand. Like if you can kind of show the arc of your business, it's like whatever the metric is, it's just gathering pace. He's like combine those two factors: storytelling and momentum. Sometimes, yeah, I agree with you for the most part. But check this out. What kind of decision are people making when they buy a liquid death? It's an emotional decision, right? Yeah. And they want to be accepted. They want to be cool. It's water, right? It's like, I saw recently White Claw just started offering zero alcohol that, right? Mm -hmm. And also it's behavior change. People are understanding what alcohol does to your brain. You see it in, like, listen to the Human Man Lab. Like, I, I know it's, it's another podcast, but it's like, he like there's a lot of podcasts that talk about not drinking alcohol. You see it in Silicon Valley. You see all these things, right? Why do I bring that up? Well, look at charging Petit, right? Open AI. How long have they been around? They've been around since before I moved from Atlanta to Silicon Valley. That's more than eight years ago. Right? They've been around like what seven plus years, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact founding date, but something like that, right? Only just last year have they started monetizing. But in the early days, was there momentum? No. It was like only story and team. And it wasn't a VC. Weird. It was Microsoft. It was, hey, and think about it, like, Microsoft is hitting. They're going crazy right now. But were they going crazy? That? They've always been Microsoft. So don't get it twisted. Microsoft always been a juggernaut. But they weren't, they, the, like, the cool factor that they got now, Activision, all these other things, right? Satya is going crazy with his acquisitions, his, the way he's leading everything. But they had to have the vision of the future that they wanted to see, which is this AI-driven future. Mm -hmm. It's the AGI. I don't want to speak for them because I'm not, I don't want to promote myself, but I think AGI, they're working on building AGI, right? And they had to invest a lot of money into it early, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people are like, man, like, LLMs are hot, like large language models are hot, and they are. Closed source versions, there's like open source versions, there's Hugging Face, there's Minstrel, like all these other people, right? 
Um, some people are like, man, the value's not in the LLM, right? But what are they doing? They're innovating. It's not just ChatGPT. They launched ChatGPT store yesterday, GPT team, right? They're incorporating it into search, right? They're going, what? Multi-product. They're shifting. It's a boom, 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 right? It was a seven-year process. Billions of dollars went into a zero-revenue product. How much revenue are they generating now? Over a billion in revenue a year. Consumer. And they're going crazy in the enterprise now. Dude. That's always in Microsoft's advantage. That's why Teams beat is beating the mess out of Slack. But I know the game. I study the game. That's why I could tell you all these players. You know, so like I say all this stuff just to be like fundraising. It's not just storytelling. It's not just momentum. It's not just an exit. It's not just an IPO. It's not just users. It's not just companies. It's, it can be strategic value. Money can come from investors. It can come from governments. The best money to raise is from customers. Indeed only raised one round, $5 million, and generating billions of revenue today, right? So anyway, and they were in Austin, not San Francisco, more Miami. You know, I want to get into the AI stuff, actually, because and it's actually a really interesting point. I was listening to a podcast a few days ago. It's the co-founder of DeepMind. Yeah, um, he's dope. And he's talking about starting that business in 2010. And, you know, I think when we hear AI, we think very much 2024, 2023. We think about the last year or so where it's really kind of burst onto the scene. And I think in a mainstream way, we've kind of become very aware of it. But he was saying, actually, if you just look, if you just look at the capabilities and what we've been able to do with AI in 2010 versus 2023, the orders of magnitude that the technology has improved and become more intelligent is dumbfounding. Yes. He was actually, the, the specific thing he referenced, he said, uh, there was an interview with Elon Musk where he was talking about AI and the effect that AI could have and the rate of change. We talk about momentum. The rate of change that AI is improving, what Elon Musk's thoughts on that were. And he says, it was one of the few times where Elon was like struggling to give an answer. Yeah. And I think ultimately what Elon said, he said, I'm in pure disbelief, which is the rate of increase of how this technology is improving and getting more intelligent and smarter. It's hard to even visualize, understand that, wrap your arms around that as a human, that rate of increase. And I'm kind of just curious, you know, you spoke about LLM, AGI, all this stuff. I think, and, and you know what, I even want to peel the curtain back a bit into some of our conversations. We've had conversations about AI, and you're much more knowledgeable about this than me, where we spoke about AI being like new land, like there's new opportunity. So there's people listening right now that are trying to think of what, what's the space? We spoke about that. Like, what, where are you playing? And I know for you, AI is... It's a personal interest. It's somewhere where you're getting deeper into it. Can you even just explain it at that basic level? When you talk about LLN, AGI, when people talk about how quickly AI is developing and you have world leaders and you have Elon Musk warning about the effects of AI, all this stuff, putting so much significance. You even talk about a company that's raising money at a $500 million plus evaluation without making any money but they're in the AI space. Can you just take it down to the studs, down to the basics, down to the foundation? When you say LLM, AGI, what does all of that even mean? Why is there so much significance in this space right now? So speaking of the speed part and like the rate of changes, it's the first time I've had trouble keeping up with everything that's happening, actually. Um, and it might even as the rate increases, it might be almost impossible to like keep up with every single thing that's happening. But nothing impossible. Oh God, it's hard to think about it. I like that you brought up the deep mind guy because usually when you think about AI and automation, at least like from an Elon perspective, you know, the purpose of open AI, at least me not being a player and looking at it outside it was to like keep 
this space open as possible and not closed, controlled by corporations, but for the people be, and, and figuring out how to like make sure that AI doesn't become our overlords, for example. Right. It's a fear type of mindset. Um, if I had to, you know, we talked about speed as one word. Another word that people think about, let's all give two other words, is like obsolescence and displacement. So when you think about AI, like, man, like, it's going to go away. But you also brought up the founder of DeepMind. I love the founder of DeepMind. He um, is a chess player, right? And there's a book that I'm reading called Deep Thinking by Gary Pat Kasparov, um, who was the world champion, chess player, grandmaster. And it talks about when he played IBM's um, Deep Blue, I believe is the name of Deep Blue. And Deep Blue was like a computer version, uh, like chess player hand playing a human. And it's the first time that the computer beat the human. And it was like, damn, this is going to be the end of the world, right? And this book, Deep Thinking, talks a lot about the emotion of that moment and coming to terms with this new reality and also recognizing this new way is not of displacement and obsolescence, but human-machine collaboration. And if you look at the chess world today, it's more popular than it's ever been because chess players recognize that a chess engine can easily beat the world's best chess player in the world today, Magnus Carlsen, in a game. But nobody wants to watch two engines playing perfectly against each other. They want to watch people play imperfectly with each other. And they want to analyze the games based off of these tools. And chess.com has, I know I'm going deep on this, but like they have introduced coaches. There is still human coaches. They're still in person tournaments and it's, it's popularized the game more. So going back to this whole piece of human machine collaboration, when you think about LLMs, I told you it's large language ma models. Think about it like a all knowing thing. You're already familiar with it because you guys use Google, right? Think about it like an all knowing thing where instead of like pointing you to websites, it can give you answers to whatever you look up, right? On any subject, there's, you'll probably hear terms like hallucination where it's not always reliable to know if the information that you're getting is always true and factionable, which is hallucination. But imagine that you have an all-knowing thing that you can ask questions to. Now take it to another level this thing can not only coach you, but it can also assist you, right? So there's a difference between a coach and assistant. So this all-knowing thing can also do things for you, mm -hmm. right? That make your life easier so you can focus on more human, creative, strategic, collaborative things that you didn't have to do before. And it could be trained on every single one of your podcast episodes from all your guests. And it can be multimodal where it's not just tat. It can be on video as a clone of you that you can talk to. You don't have to type to, and you can just tell it to do things. And you already know how these things kind of work. It's like Alexa and Google Home and Siri, right? Think about it like that, but just on a whole nother level that's integrated into your day-to-day -day life that is in every industry and will change every industry. That's how I think about it. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I think especially in media, a lot of the conversation around AI and the things that have gone viral, it's the doomsday scenario. Mm -hmm. It's the, this is the death of humanity. It's what, what if this thing becomes so intelligent? It's intelligent so far outweighs our intelligence as human beings that it ultimately just kind of schemes our destruction. That's the, that's the doomsday scenario. I think what you presented is actually 
the the reverse of that, the yeah. other side to it, which is what if AI is the engine? What if it's like the horsepower and then it just allows us to focus on being human? So the opportunity, and even when we spoke about new land, it's like the the areas that will that will see change, it's like, and that we can excel in as humans is the stuff that is deeply human. It can't be replicated with a machine. And so the place that I wanted to go, uh, you had this post on LinkedIn, uh, 2024 predictions by Scott Belsky that I agree with. Yeah. And there was eight, but I actually only want to focus on three. And I'll read out the three and then you can kind of give me your take on it. Because, and, and, and the reason why actually, you know what, let me give context. The reason I think this is important is when we say new land, and I remember actually us having this conversation, which is, if you think about the world historically, uh, you go back hundreds of years, it was very difficult for someone to change the fortunes of their entire family within one lifetime. Things were built over generations. If you look now, and this is why really we're so blessed and privileged to even live in this day and age, you have 17-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 21-year-olds, and it's not even their age. It's the fact that they obsessed and worked in a space for a few years and accumulated resources, knowledge, capital, network that is fundamentally going to change the entire outcome of their family moving forward generations, the speed at which we can improve and change our lives is at something we've never seen before. And that's only going to accelerate with AI. And so, you know what, let me read these, these three predictions, right? Number one, this is, this is the first one that resonated for me. The future will be personalized to your preferences. Number three, small brands will be 10 times more competitive with big brands. And all brands will compete with our objective, hyper-personalized AI agents that increasingly make purchase decisions on our behalf. And then I want to go straight to number eight. Traditional business models are disrupted and reimagined in the age of AI. So those are the 2024 AI predictions that you agree with. Take any, any of those ones I just read out. Well, oh, before going to, I'll just say like on the on the on the land piece, on the new land piece. Um, when you think about uh, the way to make a farm work, like my dad grew up on a farm, and I read in my grandfather's book now, like it requires human labor, right? It can go as dark as t slavery, right? Um, but as you look at modern farming. All right, it's increasingly being supported and 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 harvested like leveraging technology, like robotics, like you like you started to see things like that. So, as a human, you're still involved working the farm, but with technology, right? There's still humans involved. Um, and the reason why I bring it up is when you think about not just the tech industry, but any industry, whether it's trucking or flight or ain't or retail, right? There's a lot of humans in these worlds. But as we make this transition into a knowledge economy, there will be robots in the warehouses, robots driving our streets with driverless cars, driverless trucks, uh, electric sustainability, like all kinds of different things that are going to be changing as we go into this knowledge economy. Okay. Now, what do you think about a knowledge economy and new land? It's not just, um, it's not just, um, physical land to be mined. It's digital land. All right. When you think about shopping, like when we talked about shopping agents that you brought up on this thing, you have huge economies that exist in the billions of people on WhatsApp globally, all right? People buy and sell a trade through text message, Venmo, you know, cash app, all these things, right? 
Instagram. So many people get fashion advice, architecture advice, all, all these things like through Instagram, right? And so if you start training a model on your preferences, on your styles, you can upload images on ChatGPT and it'll tell you things about it. And you start like as a, as a fashion image, like uploading what you want, you can train something to search things in the new way like we talked about with Fussy or with Bard or whatever these things like or Anthropic, whatever. Um, and then it could just do things for you. You just say, hey, I want to, every month I want you to send me things in this style, like, or show me, and give me a preview, like I could prove it, like whatever, like it can do things on your behalf, right? That is incredibly powerful. You have a whole personal shopper category that exists today. You might not need that in the future. Or you might make personal shoppers better by leveraging agents to do these things for their clients mm. better, right? On this podcast, right? I, I wish I had a personal shopper so I could like, you know, wear cool clothes and chains and that aren't mine. That happens all the time. Like people leverage these things like, what if I wanted to show up in a certain style so we could be coordinated and my agent could just tell me, hey, I'm going to be in a penthouse. This is going to be in the back. You know, this how line is going to work, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I could, it could just do it, right? That would that'll make my life easier. I think that's going to exist. And it's not just the commerce. It's not just going to happen in a retail store. These clothes, these chains, these shoes can come through the creator economy, right? And this day and age, talking about digital land versus physical land, you can come up with a brand in your house and sell it on Instagram and never meet anybody and have a podcast talking about your philosophy on. So, which leads into personalization, right? You can have the most niche, uh, the most niche idea ever, but because the world is now, I believe 8 billion people, and the world is increasingly being connected by the internet, uh, especially with Starlink. For people that don't know, what Starlink is is launching global internet for the world. Eventually, that's their vision, part of their vision. And if everybody's connected on the internet, then there's going to be somebody in the world that aligns with something that you care about, and so. You can instantly connect with that person online by getting it out the right way. And not only is that good for you, but if I am a brand that wants to find somebody that wants to purchase or use or leverage my things or my service or my product or my music, whatever that I'm creating, I can personalize that specifically to you. When you start going from single digits to tens of digits or hundreds of thousands of diversity, hundreds of thousands of millions, then personalization is really, really hard. And before that required humans. And when I talked about deep mind before I was talking deep mind, when it beat Gary Kasparov, it was not the AI that we're talking about right now. It was algorithms that like uploaded a bunch of games historically, and then like leveraged what it knew about the games to beat the human today. You know, the deep my founder talks about this, like the AI just learns quickly and just gets better. And that scares people because like, damn, like, can we get so intelligent that it just like beats me at things? No, but what if it just learns more and more and more about you, just gets better and better and better at personalized things for you, mm. right? Like if I go to McDonald's or Starbucks, like every, like there's some of the most complicated Starbucks order drinks with like just a little bit of ice. This is this must be coffee, blah, blah, blah. All these things like every brand is going to start leveraging technology to get more and more personal, right? Uh, and you're starting to see that even on, on Spotify, music creation, things like that. On uh, business models, right? Software as a service, for example, is changing, right? Like people aren't just doing SaaS these days. A lot of people are following usage models. A lot of people are following you know, are transitioning for how they think about the quality of revenue from the marketplace. Like a lot of people are thinking about 
what are new business models that can be, like you said, have stuff sub stack with subscriptions. You see like different ways that people are monetizing courses that aren't just from a school or a Coursera, like they're figuring out how to offer their personal services in different ways than they were able to do before, but build a big following of not just a physical event that your show might host, right? With mm -hmm. thousands of people, but virtual events or even the metaverse, right? Which is a whole another level of land, right? You got the vision pros coming out. What kind of economy is going to come out with the vision pros? Mm. Apple for the people that don't know, right? And I don't know what the new models are going to be, but that's going to be something else that comes, right? Um, there was one more that you called out. Those were three. Future will be personalized. Small brands will be 10 times more brands. competitive with big yeah. brands. I mean, this is very Silicon Valley where, um, you know, I told you I believe in guys. So like David and Goliath is classic storage, right? It's like the biggest, the biggest difference between a startup and a big company is speed, right? And when you think about a small brand versus a big brand, one of the advantages and the reason why it can move fast is because it has little bureaucracy, little hierarchy, little debate. I could read a book. I could hear something that you told me. And then tomorrow I'll get, I can just leave today and just like, Hey, we're doing this. Let's go. Right. Mm -hmm. But now, even when you have big companies and you have a small brand, like there's, there's a lot of things that a small brand can leverage like a human to have superpowers. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you, what, what do I mean by that? You probably hear Silicon Valley talk about doing more with less. Right. Yeah. So, um, if you have a bunch of tools that make you more productive as a human, and I have a team of 50 people with my small brand and my small company, WhatsApp, by the way, was 50 people before it got acquired for $19 billion. Imagine if those 50 people had all these AI tools back then, mm. what kind of reach could they have got? Mm. See what I mean? The horsepower. So we're talking about exactly they got the engine. So today, um, I wouldn't be shocked if you start seeing billion dollar companies built by sub 10 person teams mm -hmm. in the future. I'd be today or not. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, um, I think when, when Elon talks about just being in pure disbelief of what this could mean, like what this technology can do. It's interesting because I think a lot of what we've seen, especially on the commute com consumer side to this point has been like a chat GPT. And I remember, uh, one of our conversations, and this is actually when it started to click a bit for me, when you were talking to me about this, a lot of the current applications of AI are very prompt driven. So we're kind of in phase one, right? Like we're, we're very early stages right now. And you know what, actually anyone that we speak about like chat GPT, anyone that hasn't used chat GPT, actually encourage them to use it just to kind of see what it can do. Cause it's already, it's already a big unlock, like hmm. agencies, businesses, even people personally. Hmm. You can be able to apply to jobs, mm -hmm. sending resumes, Massive. In, using ChatGPT to do that. However, here's the thing. And I remember when you said it, it clicked a bit for me, which is these are prompt driven. So you're typing in a question or you're giving the context for something that you have, and then you're asking AI to produce something and it does it and it does it incredibly fast, which is great. However, that's only phase one. Phase two is more what you're talking about, which is, well, what if this... What if it goes from being prompt driven to being more like an assistant? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like the AI just knows you. And I know that that even sounds a bit scary to even say, but what if it just understood you and things that you haven't even maybe articulated for yourself, it just knew from its knowledge of you that this was something that you wanted. I mean, it sounds scary, but like, does Instagram know you? Does Google know you? Does Amazon know you? Look at look at look at what pops up on your explore fleet. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's interesting. And 
for the people that haven't used ChatGPT, I understand, right? It's like learning how to search, learning how to Google, learning how to prompt is a skill. A prompt engineer is literally a role that is being created. But for the people that are just using it to ask questions and get answers, uh, you might want to try giving it a persona. Like, imagine you are the world's best food connoisseur and you specialize in finding the best Wagyu beef in any, any city, right? Um, and you give advice on restaurants and, and how to describe the flavors, whatever. You give it that persona and then like you just create that scenario, right? Then you ask questions to ChatGPT and it'll give you answers about why the beef, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what if you name it something? Let's name it Alex. And then you create another persona and you name it Jane. You can actually get those personalities talking to each other. So so then instead of prompting things, like Tajik G has memory, you can say, Alex and Jane, can you help me with this? And it already knows his personas and it can give you answers to help you with things. Mm -hmm. Right. If you take it to the next level and you start thinking about how does it leverage the tools in your everyday life? You mentioned Calendly before. But we were talking offline. Google Calendar, Notion, Google Docs, Google Sheets, blah, blah, blah. What if it could, you know, when you think about enterprise, you think about third party integrations. But what about the tools that we use in our everyday life? And how can you just Call on Alex and Jane. Make me a list in Notion of what I need to do for the week and put it in my calendar. Mm -hmm. These different aspects of your life that previously were all disparate, they were working in isolation. What if there was something that they were all interacting so it was just seamless integration? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, and, that, and that can be applied in your personal life, in your professional life, in your business, all these things, you know? Yeah. We could literally have like a three hour conversation just about AI. Yeah. But you know what? We have to get out of here. Yeah. And so this is where I want to end. We spoke a lot about hundred million dollar companies, building $500 million companies, building $1 billion companies. And I think the numbers are nice. The impact is nice. But for me, I always go back to like the why. Like, why do you even want to do this? Like, why? And so when you reflect on your story, Ruben Harris, we spoke about 2018. We spoke about you even starting. We spoke about even the pride of saying like, this is my thing. Like I started this thing and I've been running it for six, seven years. Tell me about your why. Why are you doing all this stuff? It goes back to what we talked about before. It's, it's a product that I wish I had, I had when I was breaking into tech. And when you think about breaking into tech or breaking into startups or getting your first job, now that we've helped thousands of people get jobs, and even now that I'm running a company, I've been thinking a lot about people enablement and how to enhance the satisfaction, loyalty, and performance of someone in a company, including myself, right? How do I, how do I get better over time? And it's kind of like raising a child. There's no playbook. Mm. There's no playbook. After you get in the company, like, yes, they'll have like, you'll get hired for something. You'll get, be given job responsibilities. They'll tell you what your levels are. They'll tell you what the how you get promoted. But it, when it comes to the doing, which we talked about, which is what ultimately matters, you're just expected to do the job and that's it. But 
there is this world of coaching. There is this world of books. There is this world of advisor. And if you could have someone or something that can be your companion at work, that helps you put your career on autopilot, that helps you not just be the most performant, productive, efficient person in the world, but helps you discover your purpose and align your work to it so you could achieve your full potential, I think the world will be a much better place. So career karma is bigger than helping people get jobs and helping people thrive at work. It's helping people reach their full potential and achieve their purpose collaboratively. And that's why we think so much about community. So that's that's why I'm doing this. Mm, you know, actually one thing, um, I've been following you on Instagram for like over a year now. And a lot of the the things that you even mention and speak about and give significance to, it's not necessarily typically what we would see from a from a founder, especially of like a tech a tech business. And I even think of like moments that you show with family, mm -hmm. all of these things. I just I guess when it comes to the story of Ruben Harris, why why does that matter? Like why does that hold such a significance well when you think about where you spend the most time right it's either going to be at work with your family or with your friends some people spend a lot of time by themselves right but we're social people we saw that a lot through the covid thing like we want to connect with others right um the time that you spend with other people outside of your family and work could be productive, it could be not productive, it could be casual. And you see a lot of people talk about work-life balance or work-life integration, but I think a lot about work-life harmony. There is no separation. If you have aligned with what you feel like you are called to do, and there's a difference between a job, a career, and a calling, right? And similarly, in school, so people have struggles picking majors because a lot of times they're picking majors based off of what is going to pay them the most money, right? But if you can actually get to this point where you have done the inner work, not just understanding the problems that you have, but the things that you care about, and you can follow that curiosity and discover this this purpose that that helps you run through walls, that calling provides for everything else and, and it reminds you of what really matters. Like if you can align meaning and purpose to work, everything else works out. And it's not a gender role thing. It's not just a man thing. Like women are called to do things too. Like women are more educated than men these days. They're making more money. They're like, there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening in this knowledge economy shift, there's a really good book called um, Boys and Men talking about how men are being affected by this shift from work to the knowledge economy because they're used to lifting things in. Now that you don't have to do that so much, the women are actually thriving a lot mm. in this type of environment. Even better. But obviously, it depends on what part of the world that we're talking about, what industries. But like, the reason why you see me talk a lot about those types of things is money, career, billion dollar company, none of that matters. At the end of the day, are you healthy? Are you loved? Are you aligned spiritually, emotionally, mentally? And do you have friends, maybe, right? Like, at the end of the day, if you had 24 hours to live, what are you focused on? What matters? Mm -hmm. If I die today, after this podcast, I'll be happy. Because I, like, I feel like this is not just for me. I live a life of service, right? And this is not just for my company. If my nephew... My sister heard this. My parents heard this. They're proud of me. Mm. That's special. That's special. You know what? And and this this can be the we can end with this. Is 
one of the things I think about, and you even mentioned like being able to run through walls. And even earlier on, you mentioned that there's, there's moments where you've thought about quitting. There's moments where you've thought I, it's enough. And there's certain, we've all had those times and I've had it. I left my job 11 months ago and I've had those moments. And when I get to those moments, there's somewhere where my mind goes to where it's like, not yet. Like, give it another time. There's something that my mind keys in on. And, and what it is, is I just think about kind of like where I came from, like where it started. I think about a um, like single mom for 10 years raising me and my brother. My dad was still involved. And then I think about even living with my dad from 11 until 21 and everything that he taught me. Some of the decisions. You spoke about faith earlier. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the bets that they made on me when in that moment, there wasn't anything there. It wasn't what it is now. Right? I just reflect on that. And so I'm curious for you, when you reach those moments where it just feels like you're being hit, is a solid fucking brick wall in front of you the obstacle feels insurmountable what it what is that reflection for you what what is it that you think about it's a familiar feeling so like what's what's cool about being in the game six years like i remember like after that preceded round or getting rejected and or like and having to raise money and not thinking that it was possible. And I remember, I remember being in this church and a choir was coming to sing. It's Oakwood's choir, the Aeolians. And the bus, the night before Friday night, got into a car accident and caught on fire. Everybody survived. All of their things got burned up. They still showed up to the church without their tuxes on and they sang, we shall overcome. When you see brick walls, when I heard that song, and I eventually raised the money in, I didn't know how I was going to overcome. I didn't know how I was going to fight. But what is faith? Faith is evidence of things not seen. It's a lot of other things. Um, but when you talk about, you know, your mother, I think that's what you said. She's a single mom, right? Mm -hmm. What drove her to go through all the hardships? Belief in you, like meaning, right? Victor Frank will search for meaning. What drives someone to go through something as painful as the Holocaust or someone in slavery still singing songs, right? Um, I'm not, I have, have not gone through something as dark as that in my life. But when I say a familiar feeling with all the wars going on in the world, like I, I, I have a team in Ukraine. I went to Ukraine before the war. Right? I have team members that are Jewish and Muslim. Right? So I, 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 I feel, I feel. But what drives you to overcome is despite all the darkness, despite everything that's going on in the world, like when I see the people fighting, like I don't know if people know this, like one of the biggest attacks that ever happened in Ukraine happened this January, like January 2nd, right? Uh, and this is not a political conversation. I'm not going to get into none of that, but it's more of like when I see these people just show up and still smile every day, you have this crazy feeling 
of responsibility. And like them, like they believe not in me, not even in the business. They believe in the vision. They believe in what we're doing for other people that are going through things. You see? Mm. And so if I see a wall that I'm faced with, I have to go through it because if I don't go through it, what happens to everybody else? That's what I was called to do. That's special. Special episode, man. Thank you so much for coming on. There, bro. Appreciate it. Oh, man. That was something right there.